Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really, truly privileged to be here and represent my colleagues in the uh, cardiovascular theme. I'm new to the theme and I'm new, the new lead, and therefore I will be mostly looking forward uh, uh, on what we are going to do. So uh, we are very privileged here in Oxford to have a large uh, mass of uh, um, cardiovascular investigators. We have uh, six British Heart Foundation professors with our program grants. And uh, overall, yearly, we have a research income of about 20 million, excluding the NIHR. Uh, we are very multidisciplinary in terms of how we work acro across medical specialties, but also across fields, and in particular, we have uh, a very good collaboration with computer science, engineering, and uh, others uh, such as chemistry, for instance. So we also have strong external links, uh, and these are consortia that are founded, funded by the EU, alas, uh, the, uh, NI, uh, the NIA, as well as industry and uh, uh, Fondation Leduc uh, networks of excellence. So we are blessed by a strong infrastructure where we can carry out uh, um, studies in acute patients, such as in AVIC, uh, and also we have uh, uh, Stefan Neubauer and OCMR that have been instrumental really in uh, enhancing our ability to uh, phenotype uh, our patients to a fantastic level, which I will show in a minute. We also have uh, great resources that have been built uh, during the previous years, uh, uh, mostly and uh, not exclusively through NIHR funding, and these constitute cohorts of patients, but also resources such as large tissue banks, uh, which uh, are instrumental in all of our uh, work uh, um, building up into the uh, clinical studies. So uh, what I would like to communicate really is that uh, behind our clinical science, there is a very strong pipeline of basic science that is underpinning it. So my colleagues and I would normally take tissue from patients uh, undergoing cardiac surgery, that's usually vessels, uh, uh, myocardial tissue, adipose tissue, and use it uh, to run a number of uh, biochemical and cell studies, which we then validate data in uh, small animal models, which we also invested a lot in uh, phenotyping in a sophisticated manner, uh, large animals with external collaboration mostly, and we bring all of this knowledge back into our clinical studies through uh, both clinical trials, patient-based investigation mechanistic, as well as uh, phenotyping and using national uh, resources such as the UK Biobank. So, uh, moving on, on to the phenotyping, we've made huge progress uh, with OCMR and uh, uh, um, Stefan, as I was saying, and, and uh, we now can uh, phenotype uh, heart disease, uh, uh, both acute and chronic, and uh, we have uh, developed uh, T1 mapping for uh, uh, the imaging of uh, diffuse fibrosis in the heart, as well as uh, uh, fiber structure uh, by, uh, yeah, this this one, um, in fiber structure of the heart, which is particularly uh, diffusion tension imaging is called, which is particularly uh, important in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, understanding really and helping this to stratify uh, the risk uh, of arrhythmia. So um, 3D flow is also uh, very important, both uh, for understanding uh, cardiac functioning and understanding the uh, thromboembolic risk in patients with uh, um, dilated cardiomyopathy or uh, atrial fibrillation. We also do some kind of metabolic imaging uh, using 7 Tesla uh, magnet of uh, phosphorus spectroscopy as well as the unique um, ability to actually detail and phenotype uh, um, um, metabolics uh, in, in the heart through the polarizers. And we do this both in the uh, heart and in the brain because uh, acute stroke is also part of the cardiovascular theme. 
So having said that, uh, uh, the main aims of the BRC3 in the cardiovascular team is to really refine risk stratification and management uh, in patients with acute and chronic uh, cardiovascular disease, as well as test novel interventions in common acquired uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, but also inherited conditions that at the moment have no uh, real treatment. So we are sitting right into the cluster of uh, um, chronic diseases, uh, and, uh, but also have uh, interaction with digital health and genomics, as well with this cross-cutting uh, themes. And uh, as uh, Keith was saying, I will give you an example on how really we are integrated within the cluster. And uh, I give the example that I'm familiar with, with uh, of atrial fibrillation, to show really how we work uh, more than this being represented of all we do, which is much more than this. So uh, the connection uh, of atrial fibrillation are with uh, stroke, uh, experimental therapeutic, digital health, obesity, and diabetes, and I'll show you how uh, it works. So just to have a, a little uh, introduction, the problem with uh, atrial fibrillation uh, is that it's a very common arrhythmia. One in four of us is a bit like back pain, really. Uh, one in four of us is going to develop before we are in the elderly side of uh, age. And uh, we know that it's associated with about a seven-fold increase in stroke, uh, high risk of heart failure, and uh, with very high medical cost, uh, more or less using one to three percent of what is the total NHS budget, and that was about 10 years ago. So well, the problem is that the uh, number of admission to a hospital from patients with atrial fibrillation has risen by about 60% in the past 20 years, and so has the number uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation ablation procedure, with a total cost estimated at 2.2 billion per year, which is looking increasingly non-sustainable. Uh, it is not sustainable also because actually none of this is uh, uh, so much as curing the patients. And in fact, in over all of these years, the only uh, treatment that has been shown to impact on patients' outcome is anticoagulations. All of the others is really done for symptoms. So we need to do something here to change the natural history of the disease and, uh, uh, and also to... Uh, phenotype and stratify these patients for risk quite carefully. So at the moment, this is what we do. We have a score, uh, which is quite crude uh, in terms of uh, uh, defining what are the risk for these patients to develop, uh, uh, patient with fibrillation to develop stroke. And in the population, we can see that how the score increases, the risk increases. And that is all true, but are we doing actually enough? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, not all atrial fibrillation is clinically manifest, and depending on the age range and the and duration of monitoring of the electrocardiogram, we can miss between 5 and 40 percent of uh, silent uh, uh, atrial fibrillation in different populations. So how are we going to go around this? Well, what we are proposing is to do a randomized screening for silent atrial fibrillation in high-risk individuals. And we are using this uh, uh, technology here, which is a, a sticky plaster, essentially, with two electrodes and a chip in between that can record the uh, ECG for two weeks, um, non-obtrusively. The patient can watch, watch shower, do all sorts of things, and uh, they quite like it, unlike the halter tapes, and about two-thirds uh, of the participants which have uh, uh, been trying this patch in our pilot study liked it, and uh, what it is interesting is that uh, we can get 13.7 days of analyzable ECG out of these patches with uh, a... Um, um, mean analyzable time that is 99.6. So it's got a really extremely high performance. And so we are hoping that, and any can be done, but it, this patch can be sent at home. The patient doesn't need to come to the hospital or doesn't, it's all done, you know, uh, outside. So it's, a, I think, a fantastic uh, uh, tool and a fantastic development. 
and looking at the queues uh, uh, to the car park of the John Radcliffe. So uh, we have, however, two questions here, uh, uh, having had this data, and, and these are, how good are we actually in assessing stroke risk in individual patients? I've shown you the data from a population, and uh, does silent atrial fibrillation carry the same stroke risk as symptomatic atrial fibrillation, because what we know, the data that we are, have, are all based on the garden variety of symptomatic atrial fibrillation. And I think these are important questions. And if we take the chas vas score and we looked at the area under the curve of the receiving operating curve, we see that it's between 0.56 and 0.69. So from more or less tossing the coin to slightly better. So it's not great. And there is a risk, I mean, a real need of improving this. Uh, and also, in certain categories of patients where these studies have been possible so far, and those are patients carrying a pacemaker or a, a defibrillator that can detect atrial fibrillation, uh, we, know, we, we know that the risk of, atrial fib uh, of stroke in this patient with silent IF seems to be lower, but we don't know in other groups. And uh, we need to remember that the incidence of major bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage, even with the modern uh, anticoagulant, is still 3 to 4% a year. So it is not a free lunch, that uh, anticoagulation. And as such, it is particularly important to restratify the patients uh, very accurately. So the questions are, does the burden of atrial fibrillation, um, having some silent episodes or having atrial fibrillation all the time, influence the st oops, stroke risk? Uh, does the silent atrial fibrillation carry the same risk of stroke? What is the natural history of atrial fibrillation? Would it eventually, uh, silent atrial fibrillation, would it eventually become clinically manifest? Or, and can stratification of stroke risk uh, be refined and also of bleeding? And so we are planning to uh, answer this question by uh, working within UK Biobank. You will know that UK Biobank recruited five th <coughs> half a million participants uh, about 10 years ago, and all of them uh, gave uh, history, physical measure, blood, urine, and uh, agreed to access to the health records. So it's a unique uh, um, resource. Uh, all of those are genotype, uh, they have biomarkers, and 100,000 of these patients are undergoing the imaging uh, uh, court, uh, the imaging sub-studies, and that is they will have MR uh, of the brain, the heart, the abdomen, uh, carotid ultrasounds for the uh, plaque burden, as well as uh, uh, markers of uh, test of cognitive function. So within this cohort, we really like to uh, detect atrial fibrillation, both the normal one and the silent one. And then we would have uh, enough data really to look at all of the factors and uh, environmental and genetics that are associated with uh, these forms of atrial fibrillation. And uh, we would be able to probably and hopefully re uh, refine the uh, stroke risk by adding information from brain imaging, uh, uh, the carotid, the heart, and the abdomen, such as, for instance, fat distribution. So what is it that we will achieve with these studies? Well, we will assess the prevalence of silent IF and risk factors. We will establish the causality of these risk factors by using, say, Mendelian randomization approaches within UK Biobank. We will evaluate the impact on silent IF prospectively on the risk of stroke, MI, dementia, and vascular death. And uh, we will also uh, um, clarify what is, uh, you know, whether the burden of atrial fibrillation is actually associated with a different uh, risk of stroke. And uh, uh, we will um, refine stroke certification and as well as uh, um, evaluate the cost effectiveness of actually diagnosing silent IF in these patients. So 
Having said that, we move then on, on what are the domain of management of atrial fibrillation. And uh, you will know that there are two main interventions that we apply to patients with atrial fibrillation. So one is oral anticoagulation, as well as management of risk factors that has, as I said before, an impact on stroke prevention and therefore on uh, uh, improving life expectancy. And then we have... Uh, all sorts of uh, other interventions that are costly and are also associated with some adverse effect and risk that are done for symptoms, which is a perfectly good reason. But it just goes, you know, it just happens that there is some confusion, both amongst the patients and sometimes amongst general practitioners or other physicians, as to which is what is doing which. Right? And therefore, there is uh, uh, a lot of evidence across Europe uh, that uh, the antiarrhythmic therapy is actually applied uh, in a way that is not uh, appropriate. So because of that and because of this awareness, we are planning to uh, have a software-assisted management program uh, for uh, atrial fibrillation in these patients, as well as launching a patient's education and awareness program about that. Uh, we have already, uh, with EU funding, produced uh, an app and other aids uh, that guide the management, uh, the, the physician through the management of these patients to make sure that the right choices and the right information is given. And similar uh, approaches in the Netherlands have had a, a huge impact, really, on both uh, hospitalization and cardiovascular death, uh, mostly by educating the patients and in increasing the awareness and therefore the adherence, not so much the initiation, but the adherence to anticoagulation. So the other link that we have with the uh, um, obesity theme is really again related with atrial fibrillation and the huge impact that losing weight has on uh, uh, a life free of atrial fibrillation in patients who've had already an episode or even had already ablation for atrial fibrillation. You can see here that uh, uh, losing 10% of body weight in patients uh, uh, that are uh, um, uh, overweight, not even obese, uh, is associated with a six-fold increase in uh, uh, long-term freedom from atrial fibrillation, as well as all sorts of beneficial remodeling of the heart, the atrium, the blood pressure, the lipids, uh, uh, the glycemia, and inflammation index. So these are observational uh, data, and so we are planning to actually do a randomized controlled trial of weight loss in patients with atrial fibrillation and to see whether this can be sustained as this data seems to uh, suggest. You know, these are data of five years follow up of these patients. So uh, the last thing that I'm going to show is the type of study that uh, Keith and I have been doing, starting from this tissue and uh, um, work on human tissue and then on, on mice, and coming up with proof of principle studies in man. So what we have is uh, um, experimental evidence that indicate that hyperglycemia is in itself sufficient to increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. And we also know that stimulating myocardial nitric oxide production by providing a cofactor of the enzyme that produces nitric oxide, which is BH4 or tetrahydrobiopterin, increases the myocardial glucose uptake by, uh, via an insulin-dependent transporter. So, and by doing that, it completely uh, prevents myocardial dysfunction and uh, uh, altered energetics in diabetic animals. And we also know that preparation of BH4 are available already in use uh, in patients for, with phenylketonuria. So we are going to apply this knowledge in uh, uh, patients with diabetes. Uh, we uh, have this beautiful phenotyping technique to see whether this is reversing the energetic imbalance in the myocardium, and then we would take it over both in uh, uh, some form of heart failure and uh, in atrial fibrillation. So in summary, I hope uh, uh, you agree with me that the uh, cardiovascular theme of the OSCO BRC is supported by a very strong pipeline of research and innovation. 
and it takes advantage of unique local and national resources and for the benefit of patients within the NHS, both in the hospital but also in the community. And that uh, our plan overarching is to really partner with patients and help professionals across the disciplines to provide effective and also affordable care. Thank you very much. Thank you.